Adrian, welcome back to the show. Thanks very much for having me. Adrian, how do you feel about Australia's future? Generally, Greg, I feel good about it. Uh, there's no other country I'd rather be living right now than Australia, mm -hmm. but there's no doubt we have some pretty serious challenges that we're up against across a whole range range of the economy, um, but, but I'd rather be here than anywhere else. Do you think we're intellectually honest with ourselves of the challenges ahead of us? Greg, I think um, in parts we are, but in a lot of ways we're not. Mm -hmm. um, and what, what we're talking about here are, are complex issues. But if you look at Australia's ranking in economic complexity, for example, mm -hmm. you know, we're ranked 93 out of 133. And um, we're, we're nested in between um, you know, Pakistan and Uruguay. Um, so if you look at economic complexity as a, as a proxy for resilience, yep. for economic resilience, yep. we've got a lot of work to do. And then if you look at the areas that the government has identified as being areas that Australia has to be really good at, mm -hmm. and these represent future industries, yep. just statistically, um, our companies in those areas, in those five areas, 93% of them are less than 20 people in size today. So hold, let's just go back a little bit. So what is economic complexity? How is that measured and what do you, what's that cover? Yeah, so economic complexity is a function of how um, concentrated our economy is to yep. particular sectors. So yeah, okay. as, as an example, yeah, we're very strong in mining and that's helped us get to where we are now. Yes. But the skills, the industries that we need to create are different going forward. and we're not as strong as we think we are in the areas that we've got to build muscle. Yeah, I looked at it on the weekend. I went through the whole of the um, the major producers in the country, and it was all mining in some in some form or another. So what worried me is where's the development coming from and where's the thinking coming from? So you're saying we're bandied between Pakistan and Uruguay. So therefore, the future is not looking, looking a bit bleak in that regard? Well, it's just if you look at the last 10 years as well, we've yep. slid 10 places. And look, that's just one one indicator and one indices. Mm -hmm. But if you look at what's going on macroeconomically, and even if you consider what's going on geopolitically, economic growth is fundamental. Like we've got to grow GDP, we've got to grow jobs, yep. we've got got to grow productivity, we've got to create new industries. Today in Australia, it's about one to two percent of Australian businesses create something that's innovation that's taken to the world for the first time, one to 2% of our businesses. The rest are, are taking ideas and innovations from overseas and domestically modifying them for our markets. And I think, Greg, we're better than that. I think that we should be uh, really doubling down on, on businesses that are new to the world and innovations that are new to the world. Well, where is the imagination coming from then in Australia? So, and how is it incentivized? Yeah, I mean, to to foster innovation, yep. um, you can talk about it at a whole of country level, you can talk about it at a company level, um, even, even a mindset um, individually, but it's not, it's hard, right? Innovating is hard. Um, I think we tend to overemphasize research innovation. So we talk about our research sector and how do we translate research into economic outcomes. Research is just one type of innovation. So, for example, you've got business process innovation. And if you think back to the Japanese car manufacturers and just-in-time manufacturing, mm -hmm. that was an innovation around business processes. And, and a lot of value can be unlocked around that. Or vertically integrating. If you look at you know, Apple and the first iPhone, Apple didn't develop any of the core componentry. Like they didn't, they, they didn't invent it. But what they did was they integrated it in a way that it hadn't been integrated before to create a new value proposition for the customer. So I think part of what we need to do is to broaden the definition of innovation in the country. Well, where, when you say you broaden the definition of innovation, where are we going to spend our, or where are we going to get the best bang for our buck then, Adrian? You know, you're saying that we're pretty limited in the sense of well-known for mining, but what are the other sectors you think Australia can have a real play in? I think Australia's, well, first of all, there are several. Okay. And um, if I'm coming across bleak, it's only because I care. Yep. And I think that we're at a real 
pivotal fork in the road where there's been a lot of discussion around how do we evolve our businesses and how do we be globally competitive and match match fit yep. uh, globally. And, and are we at this moment? I, in, in a lot of ways, we're not. Um, and there, there's a lot of indicators to, to support that we're not. Um, but where we are good is if you look at med tech, for example, and biology-based industries, mm -hmm. we've had some success. Um, in data platform businesses, so you think about you know, Atlassian and some of the next wave coming through like a safety culture or a deputy, we've had some success. But overall, we need, we need more of those kinds of companies. Um, and, and of course, I mean, the country's making a huge bet on quantum quantum computing and in the last you know in the last couple of months we've seen pretty controversial major vet bet by the federal government in partnership with the Queensland government you know yeah. up over 900 million dollars of a combination of debt and equity to back Psi quantum uh, and really help position Queensland as as a center in the country for quantum computing yeah, but how do we scale Adrian you know I, I, I always heard it was we, we just don't have the capital well, it's interesting, right? So if, 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 if you look again at the structure of our economy, yep. we've got a long tail of small businesses. And the reason 1% to 2% only innovate in large part is because the ambition is not there for, for others to want to innovate. We have this you know, label of a lifestyle business, and there's nothing wrong with that. I'm not criticizing that we have lifestyle businesses. But 70% of businesses in Australia are less than four people. Right, so we've got this long tail, and then at the other end, the big end of town, we've got oligopolistic market structures where the protections um, come from scale, but but there's also a drive, a regulatory push to stack the odds in favour of the incumbents. So it doesn't matter if you're talking about media, you know, banking, uh, retail. There's two or three major players uh, in each of those categories, and I remember. You know, Data 61, we were asked to lead the standards advisory work for open banking, which yes. was a push to, um, I guess, level the playing field by putting the controls back with the consumer to say, that's not the bank's data, that's my data. I'm the customer. And if I want to shop around, I can get access to all of my history to make it easier to move to a different bank. It's like a bit like number portability with telcos. Yeah. If you remember when that came on, there was a Big uplift in yep. competition yep. in telco. Um, but what you see is, just as one example, you see the banks pushing back on new tech coming out of the US and other parts of the world like Apple Pay and saying, we need regulatory protection against that sort of a, um, that sort of a player. They should be held to you know, the same standards that we are or different standards. But then on the other side of that, um, there's a lot of public statements about the support for open banking, but it's been a long and windy road. And and you couldn't honestly say the banks have really lent in and 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 been huge advocates for open banking. And you understand why, because there's potential to open up new lines of competition for them. Yeah. So we've just got to get more, more ambitious, um, you know, foster uh, competition. And I think government has a role in the policy settings that really foster more competition. And then in terms of capital, there's different kinds of capital, mm -hmm. right? So you've got, if you think through the life, life of a company, you've got angel. Like if I'm starting a company, I've got angel investors, high net worths. And then I'm moving to uh, early, early stage venture capital. Then I'm moving to uh, capital that's really targeted towards scaling a business. Then we've got another bucket of capital called private equity. Um, and then we've got the public markets and, and, and then you've got debt and an ex example of, uh, you know, growth in, for example, private credit. Um, so new, new sources of credit. So the thing I'd say across all of that is Australia has been very good at private equity. Macqu Macquarie Bank is, you know, we talk about innovators. I think Macquarie Bank is an absolute exemplar of, of an innovative company that, Pioneered, pioneered infrastructure investing um, and, and did it with a global mindset. 
and and effectively created a new new asset class uh, and demonstrated that money could be made in that asset class. So we're very good at private equity. Historically, we haven't been so good, you know, at venture. Um, and you had firms like you've had firms emerge like Blackbird, uh, Airtree, yeah. that are more in the style of a U.S. venture capital firm, mm -hmm. and the returns from those have been been pretty good. Um, particularly Fund One, which included Canva, uh, that 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 was you know exceptionally good for Blackbird. Um, but we need more, and there's actually a risk right now that there's a reflex away from venture capital just at the time uh, that we need it, and then. Really, the government, and I commend the government in this, I'd argue that the check's way too small, but establishing the National Reconstruction Fund as a source of concessional capital to help Australian companies grow and scale and get access to capital, and that's really a counterbalance to the US CHIPS Act, um, that, that program, or the Industry Growth Program, which is identifying high growth companies and again, providing concessional capital. Other countries in the world do that. Um, Tesla wouldn't be here today if if the state of California hadn't have stepped in and provided concessional capital in the form of debt at a critical juncture in uh, in Tesla's history. You've worked with some of, the, you know, some of the best business heads. You've worked in the US. You've worked advising governments and prime ministers. Does Australian executives, those who build building companies, have the mindset to take the world on? Clearly, some do. Like it's it's hard to generalise. Across a population of yeah, leaders, but there's not many examples that but we have. No, there aren't, and and why the, is that too? Uh, I think if you look at the U.S., the U.S. has consistently dominated new ways of industry and technology. Consistently, um, if you go back to you know the internet, all the infrastructure companies for the internet. The search engines for the internet, um, the, you know, in, initially the browser companies for the internet, uh, software platforms like Microsoft, semiconductor technology, notwithstanding that a lot of the US semi guys outsourced to TMSC uh, in Taiwan, which you know we can we can come back to, um, and then the application level and, and including the enterprise workday, Salesforce, like Google. Um, meta, social, social media is another one. So you've got to ask, how does that country get it right? And it's not just about capital. It's about understanding growth and a growth mindset. And if you look at the best leaders in those companies, they fundamentally come up through product management. Right. Now, in Australia, we don't do product management in the same way that the US does. And let me, let me explain what I mean by product management. So if you're developing a new product or a service in the world we find ourselves in, and, and it's very different to even five years ago, the tools that are now at my disposal as a company to create new products and services and new value for my customers and consequently shareholder value are changing exponentially, right? So as a leader, I want to have a strong technical aptitude of, of what's possible, what's the art of the possible. Mm -hmm. I want to have a strong understanding of markets and, and economics and finance and how to price. And I want to have an understanding of industry structure, you know, including channels. Do it, you know, what's, what's my go-to-market? Am I going direct? Am I going through channels? What's the implications of that? Now, mapping an unmet need in the market with what's possible with underlying technology and how do I package and price that? That's product management. So you look at Bill Gates, you look at Jeff Bezos, you look at Larry Ellison at Oracle, who is a bit more of a sales guy than a product guy. Uh, the Google guys, Mark Zuckerberg, all product, all product uh, guys. They they may not have the label, but they're product management guys. And they're hard to find because good product managers become CEOs very quickly. It's the fast path to to be a CEO. And I remember when I landed back in the country mm. at Data 61, I said, I want to meet the product managers. It was the first cohort I wanted to meet. I'm like, well, you mean project manager? I'm like, no, you know, you know a project manager, discrete, start, stop. Are we delivering? Um, 
you know, on time is very different than strategically putting together the pieces I describe. Then they go, program manager. I'm like, no, product manager. So like, where are the product managers? There weren't any. So I uh, went and met with uh, most of the G of 8 university heads okay. or vice chancellors and said, are you teaching product management? And they won't. Uh, and they are, now, they call it different things now. There's elements of like design thinking. and But as a discipline, we don't teach product management. And that I think is the big unlock. A, one of the big unlocks for this country is we need to get better at product management. And our leaders today, our executives need to have that mindset. You need to have that product management mindset and that growth mindset. Does product management mean you have to be um, the first to market? Does it mean you just do something better than what already exists out there? What, what does it mean in that regard? It, 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 it's actually asking the, exactly the questions you asked. So let's take a, a new company. Yep. I want to create something new. Yep. It turns out um, there's an Australian guy in the US called Al Ramadan, and he created this group called Play Bigger. And in tech-related companies, they looked at over the last 25 years, why is it that some companies break out? And what they found was, if you're defining a category and owning the category, you're the leader, you accumulate 76% of the market cap in that particular category. Okay, right. And the rest of the industry fights over the 24%, the scraps, right? And yeah. it's expensive. And so, so you want to own the category. And product management is about all of the, how do I define the category? Is there an unmet need? What's the product or service that we need to build? How do we take it to market? How do we scale it? What do we charge for? What do we give away? And those same principles, you're operating in highly ambiguous environment. And that's the other thing that I noticed living in Silicon Valley for 18 years. Yep. Entrepreneurial leaders deal with ambiguity really well. And, and the world that we're finding ourselves in now, there's a lot of complexity and ambiguity. Yep. So I think entrepreneurial leaders as well. Now, it doesn't matter if you're starting something or if you're in an established company, like let's go right to the other end of the spectrum to a bank for, for a second, right? Money is fundamentally information. Banks have evolved and need to evolve to be platforms. They need to decide what are we going to deliver and what are we going to rely on third parties to deliver? They need to think about what customers they want to target and what, what the, so it's the same mindset that has to come into play. Mm -hmm. um, and, and there's a relentless, but, but it's not the same leadership. No, it's not product management. No. Well, it's, it's, it's executive leadership that has the principles of product management guiding them in the way they're making executive decisions. I'll give you an example. At, um, but is it as good as what could be with, with product management taking the lead? Um, yeah. I mean, look, it's a, a product manager will report to a CEO. Product management is a function. And um, they need resources, like a product manager needs resources to have the product be developed. So they work hand, hand in glove, right? But Product management will be part of an executive team. In those US companies, if it's, you know, they're probably the most important um, executive around that table is, is the head of product management. Yeah, now, okay. you've got your general counsel. Of course, you have to be compliant in what you do. Yep. You've got your CFO. Of course, you have to have the right amount of capital and be properly capitalized. But product management is where the, where the value, where the shareholder value gets created. And, and so an ex-product manager as a CEO, like the ones I talked about, um, they're going to have this constant mindset to drive value, this, this insatiable curiosity to understand how are our customers interacting with our product today, um, constantly on the lookout for adjacent markets to, to grow into, right? Jobs is another one. Like Jobs is fundamentally or was fundamentally a product guy. He was so focused on the customer experience and the way the product was put together and then ultimately combined with, with services as well in the app store and, 
and with iTunes. Um, so do we do we have enough of those leaders in Australia? No, we don't. And when I talk with people at board level and say, and this is you know both CEOs and directors, it's the thing they're using different words to describe it, but it's the hole that they're describing. It's the gap that they're describing is that you know my my team doesn't have a strong enough grasp of the technology and where it's headed and how we can apply it back to our business. Yeah. Um, my team doesn't think globally enough. Um, or, you know, in Australia, from a board perspective, it's a bit different than the US. In the US, the executive teams are, are primarily tasked with defining strategy. Mm -hmm. In Australia, more often than not, the boards define strategy and then hold the executive team to account mm -hmm. for, for delivering. And the reality is in both of those scenarios, it's a process where there's, in, there, there's input from the exec team and, and, and the board. But you've got to be able, I think, to ask the right questions. And, and just a fundamental tenet of leadership in the world that we're in right now is knowing what questions to ask, know, knowing where to push. Um, and I think that only comes about through that kind of integrated understanding of what's even possible, what's the art of the possible with the technology and tools that are emerging, how are the markets shifting, how's our operating shifting, uh, operating environment shifting, um, you know, right, right the way through to people um, as, as, as a core part of that strategy. Do we have the right team in place to execute? Do we have the horsepower? Do we have the right mix of capabilities to go execute against this strategy? And are we being ambitious enough? Like, I don't know. I was watching, um, I don't know if you watched the uh, Starship launch. Right? Yeah, what? yeah, yeah, I did. And uh, SpaceX as a company, like in terms of culture, yeah. they've got problems and they've got well-documented problems. In terms of innovating, there's a thousand changes that are going to be made to that ship um, from the last launch to the next launch. And that'll be in a period of weeks, maybe months, but not even quarters. So you think about that kind of rapid iteration and rapid learning is knowing what questions to ask, challenging the team to, you know, push boundaries that they may not have thought was possible. That's what's going on in the US day in, day out. What I just described is being match fit globally. That's that's exactly the pace, the rate of innovation, the the um, kind of the intensity of of competition so we've got to step up into that global arena and uh operate more like that well are we asking the right questions then adrian do you have the exposure do we have the right people in the room um are you what's your thoughts around that if that's the fundamental and whether we need to look at I, I i'll give you i think it's a way of thinking um so i, I find that a lot of leaders over there think in first principles. So break the problem down to its, to its absolute essence. Um, and I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, so there's a lot of talk right now about life extension, right? Extending life and being more productive. And so how would I even go about thinking about that, right? Because the underpinnings for that are exponential advancements in tech. So you talk about AI uh, and drug discovery. So simulating clinical trials, you can now do with computing and, and AI at one millionth the cost of physical clinical trials. And it's not to say that you don't do physical clinical mm -hmm. trials, but you can de-risk a lot of it using compute. And so you can accelerate the time to take new drugs to market. Because if you go, that's, that's one of the core things. How do we take, if you look at the economics of pharma, how do we take cost out of clinical trials? How do we, how do we uh, not pursue dead ends? And how do we accelerate progress? And you go, okay, well, 
Now let's go back to life extension for a minute. Today, science and tech gives us back about four months for every 12 months of us being alive. So the advancements in science and tech over any one year period are extending our life today by four by months. Four months. Okay. Now, the estimates are that sometime between 2029 and 2035, we will get back more than 12 months for every 12 months. Yeah, right. So think about that, right? Mm -hmm. And um, there's a guy called Ray Kurtzville who wrote the book Singularity is Near, who people threw rocks at the guy and said, you know, your, your predictions are off. And it turns out his predictions are more accurate than any others around the timing of AI. He's about to publish another book called The Singularity is Nearer. Um, and what he refers to is, you know, escape, escape velocity. So you think about, well, when that curve of science and tech innovation crosses over, so we're actually getting time back each year, that translates to much longer lives mm -hmm. and healthier lives. So what, are, what what's the implications of that? So the, the reason I give that as an example is these underlying technologies and tools are driving ex, driving exponentially, uh, are causing and will cause at, at an accelerated rate, structural changes in industries. So if we're sitting in Australia feeling you know, pr pretty good about our position. Yep. Um, As one of the leading miners in the world. And, and, and this, this operating environment is changing exponentially around us. Yeah. We need to have a grasp of how it's changing. I mean, you switch gears for a minute. Defense, yep. right? Our defense strategic review. It wasn't the best. It wasn't. <laughs> and it called out the fact that we had an underlying assumption about our operating environment that was false, that we would have 10 years warning of conflict. Now, I was reading on the weekend in one of the papers that actually there's been a, another national intelligence review that said actually that's collapsed to zero time with um, you know gray zone tactics to disrupt other economies. So the implications of that are profound. That goes from what what military kit do we procure, um, the way we're structured, you know how how we make decisions. Um, and even even the uh, domain, like you know, it's um, it may not be kinetic, like disruption. It may be non-kinetic. It may be I'm I'm disrupting trust in communications or trust in financial systems yeah. or trust in a food system, and so that same dynamic is playing out for business, right? So, but there's not been a let's do a whole of economy business strategic review and understand if our businesses are fit for purpose um, or, or the way we're structured or the way we're thinking. And some clearly are, but others aren't. And even the scale of the ambition. So if you look at Australia, we've got, well, we've got two companies in CSL and Combank that are 100 billion US-ish market cap, two. There's 157 in the world, and now we've got a bunch of companies that have market caps of a trillion dollars. So the challenge that would force really different thinking is to take a step back and say, what would it take for Australia to produce the next trillion dollar company? What would have to be different? And I think that's the question that we should be asking. For the um, benefit of the audience, Adrian, tell us a little bit about yourself because I think last time we, we caught up, we had a wonderful story. You um, you packed your bags, went across the States as a, as a very young man and wound up in Phillips and you and sort of turned it on its head. Was that, is that right? I don't, I didn't turn it on its head. I think that's a, like a massive over, well, you, you overreach. Said, yeah, but you certainly but look, put I, some, forward, some thinking forward. I did. I, I, um, I landed in Phillips and, and Silicon Valley at a pretty special time and it wasn't planned. Um, and I'm grateful um, for that experience. But Philips was Apple before Apple. They they did fantastic industrial design and user experiences, and um, it was consumer electronics and a and a healthcare uh, company, yep. health health device, medical device company, also semiconductors. 
And not long after I got there, they bought a handset manufacturer off of Lucent, one of the big mobile handset manufacturers. And I even bought Polygram and had had this sense that okay. hardware, software, and content and services would come together. Um, so what, what I did was I had a point of view that all of these things were going to connect to the internet. And, and that was at the time that people were just starting to use email and web browsers were just right. taking off. And Philips had invested $300 million in these proprietary protocols to do an early version of home networking, um, you know, connect, connect, connecting equipment together. So it's pretty controversial. You know, like I was 26, I pushed my way to an audience with um, the chair of the board and um, you know, basically said this thing called internet protocol. I think it's going to be pervasive. Here's the reasons why. And we should build an infrastructure to support all of Philips' devices. And uh, in, in the end, he said yes uh, and backed me to go build that business. And, and the board did too. And, but, but ironically, it was su such a simple use case. And again, that's this product management mindset. I had this vision for delivering services over these devices. And the people that were there at the time who were colleagues um, were the people that Steve Jobs hired to go build the iPod and the iPhone. Sure. So Tony Fidel was CTO of uh, Philips Mobile. He, he, he was a, a key colleague um, during that period. Um, but the use case was a simple one. It was basically you could deliver software updates over the network to a device. And that took cost out of the business for Philips, and it was a very simple um, proposition. But it was thinking through, what does Philips as a company care about? Consumer electronics is a low-margin business. Yeah. How can we take cost out of the business? Because that's what's going to resonate with the board. And all this potential of new revenue streams was harder to grip up with that board. It was hard, uh, understandably so. Um, but it was an amazing experience, and um, we we went on to build that. And what, was, what was the learnings there in the sense the exposure to the board? Because boards, a lot of their pedigree on those boards is very different to the boards we see in Australia. You touched on boards a little while back. The composition of the U.S. boards, particularly the top U.S. companies, is predominantly ex CEOs, and in some cases, current CEOs. Yeah, that's right. And well, Philips was Dutch, um, but but that's right. I mean, if you look in the U.S. This is something we don't do. Like in Australia, and when I talk with people here, directors and executives, they acknowledge that it needs to change. I hear it consistently. It needs to change. What, the structure, the composition? The, the, the composition. We, right. need, we need more current CEOs and operators sitting on boards. And the reason we need that in anything that's tech-related, and you could argue that Every company has to evolve to be a technology company. And it doesn't matter if you're a media company, you're evolving to be a technology company. You're competing with Netflix. Yep. If you're a bank, you're competing with Apple Pay. You're evolving to be a technology company. In fact, you fu fundamentally are a technology company. If I'm a you know, hospitality brand, I'm fundamentally a technology company because what I care about is the service I'm delivering to my customers, how do I acquire customers, um, I'm fundamentally a technology company. So anything that relates to technology, what the US and particularly the Valley does so well is this cross-pollination of board members. So you had Reed Hastings when he's the CEO of Netflix sitting on the board of Meta. You have um, Eric Schmidt from Google sitting on Apple's board. Yeah, well. Right? Yeah, okay. And why do you do that? Because of the diffusion of knowledge because it's happening so fast, like the changes are happening so fast. And it's, it's not that you're um, observing from a distance and commentating from reading things second and third hand and kind of inferring what tech's good or bad or how AI might impact my business. It's because you're in the, you're in the thick of it and your teams are fundamentally bumping up against problems and opportunities um, day in, day out. So you, you want to learn. And in the case of uh, innovation around tech companies, there's also business model innovation. It's been a huge driver 
of uh, of shareholder um, value creation. So even the learnings around business model innovation and how do you translate those between companies. Um, so that happens a lot in the US. Uh, it's a it's a real positive. It doesn't happen here. Um, you know, and and there have been studies done that that show that people actually do better work, they're more creative when they can context switch between a small number of things. Um, so I'm a huge advocate for it. And you know, as we grow our business, um, you know, I'd I'd overweight value, the value. Yeah. Of, of a current operator. Um, now we do that through an advisory board structure as well. Yeah. So I've got an advisory board that's got, you know, the ex CTO of Woolies on it, as an example, uh, a guy called uh, Nick Eskenazi. Now, you know, Nick's one of the best data guys in the country, and uh, he's now working with one of the big big pharmaceutical companies, um, one of the big Japanese ones. So, so yeah, we need we need. If Australia is going to catch up because we're behind, make no mistake, we're behind around some, uh, understanding these exponential changes in technology and how to apply them back to a business, we need to catch up. And one way to catch up is uh, that diffusion of knowledge through through boards. Okay, diffusion of knowledge through boards because the problem is here in Australia, we keep saying small pool and also conflict comes up a fair amount. So look, I'm not disagreeing with you. I think it's it's a smart way to go about it, and we should encourage it somewhat more. Executives, are they getting enough knowledge from looking in in here, or should they be out there in the world more? Like, how do they get? How do they improve their their insight or the art of the possible? Yeah, I mean, you would say, I'm sure you would see this, Greg, yep. and and you've spent time overseas yeah, yourself, yep. right? So, change, so change my mind completely when when you. When you talk with an executive who's spent time overseas, it's a completely different outlook. Yep. And you can't explain it, right? It, you, you have to have lived it and experienced it. Agreed. And I'm not saying that just because you haven't spent time overseas means, you know, there's not, not as great a future for you. I'd say find a way to either go spend time overseas or do some of your career with a multinational because they can move you around and they can bring that global perspective to you. Now, that that experience, you know, the cyber security company, we we dealt with countries around the world. I spent oh, a lot well, of time. Let's talk about it. Let's use that as a case study. So you finished up at Phillips, yep. um, did something else, but then before you, you knew it, you started you set up your own company, didn't you? Yeah. So one of the things we learned at Phillips when we were connecting equipment was one of the reasons people would not connect equipment or push back was what about security this was really early on so the idea of security was way more primitive than we think about cyber security today Mm -hmm. it was basically okay if i'm going to deliver an upgrade or update to that piece of equipment how do i make sure that someone else can't deliver another update to it um, and and disrupt the equipment so that led to uh, the formation of a cybersecurity company um, that we scaled at the time to be a leader in criti- securing critical infrastructure. So we were securing eight of the top 10 telcos, um, so session border controllers sitting in between eight of the top 10 telcos, United Nations communication systems, we were, we were in all of that equipment, securing that, um, elements of the F-35 Joint Strike Fighter, um, um, satellites, smart grid infrastructure, five of the seven Android handset manufacturers. We, we were pretty pervi- pervasive oh, wow. um, across civilian and uh, military domains, but but we couldn't really talk about it um, widely. Um, so that was that that was you know an incredible experience. And in the end, we had uh, strategic investors too. So. Uh, GE invested, uh, okay. Matsushita, which is the parent for Panasonic invested. So I spent a lot of time uh, over in Japan. Uh, and then we had Intel McAfee and Symantec as the enterprise guys. And they looked at us because we were focused on IoT, um, Internet of Things, mm-hmm. or industrial control systems, which um, are, are a huge risk vector right now. And there's a lot of energy and, you know, in some ways, we were we were early into that market, but but we had great product, and then we evolved that to a second line of business focused on mobile application security 
um, which S SAP resold that solution. And the culture of working in those days, wasn't this the time where it wasn't, it wasn't a surprise to see the sleeping bag on, under the desk? Yeah, I mean, when you... Maybe talks a bit about that, right? What do you, what do you got to do to... Yeah, well, what do you got to do to... What's it take? Yeah. I mean, it doesn't walk through the front door, does it? You've got to it's go hard. and get it. It's hard. And any business that starts, um, invariably, you have near-death experiences of the company. In fact, yeah, I was watching something uh, yesterday with Vinod Koslow talking about Sun Microsystems, and they had... Yeah, you know, he was talking about multiple near-death experiences where it wasn't clear we could meet payroll, and they, you know they got through it, and the rest is history. Um, most most companies along the way have that, so you've got to have a lot of grit and determination and resolve, and um, you've just got to do what it takes. So when we're shipping product, and we had to get that out because you've got to understand, like we were delivering software into handsets. That were going into to the telco market. Yeah, right. And w w we had to land a jumbo jet on a postage stamp operationally, right? Like we had to, with an eighteen month lead up, we had to land it on the day. And any any day that was late, there was huge financial penalties yeah, right, for, okay. for being late, right? So you get you've got to have this operational discipline in shipping product. Um, and were you selling the dream, or had you actually made the product? No, we had. Um, we we're on. You know, over over a hundred million devices, and we had multiple product lines, enterprise and embedded. Um, yeah, one of the key unlocks for us was in in uh, in cybersecurity. The primary attack vector um, was was operating system and CPU for the device. So that that's the vector. And with PCs and with servers, you've got. You know, a handful of operating systems and a handful of CPU architectures. Yep. But for Internet of Things, it, it's this proliferation of different operating systems and CPU combinations. So I had a brilliant co-founder and CTO who built an abstraction layer that meant that we could port our software on top of this layer that could integrate with 2,000-odd combinations of operating system and CPU. And that meant that as a, a original equipment manufacturer, like a Panasonic or a Philips, um, no matter what the form factor was, whether it was a medical device or a, or a mobile device, and if the environment was different, you could use the same software run, running on top. So there's a lot of innovation in and around that. Uh, and then more innovation in terms of, you know, how, how do you make things really high performance and small footprint and, uh, make them in a way that they don't consume batteries, uh, battery life or power. Who was backing you? Uh, so institutional investors and uh, and corporate investors. And the corporate investors were great. Um, you know, they they had a strategic need. They gave us market intelligence, help, helped us. We helped them too. And... In one case, they were a channel to market for us, and and so. But having said that, you know, we we structured it in such a way that you know a couple of them were in the boardroom as observers, as competitors with each other. So mm -hmm. it it makes for an interesting dynamic in the boardroom too, um, and and we know we we navigated that effectively as well. You're listening to No Limitations with special guest Adrian Turner. In our next episode. I sit down with Jim Askew, Chair of Sira Resources. I grew up on a sawmill in, on the western side of the Otways. It gravitated into a, a farm and uh, earth moving. And I wanted to be a mathematician and uh, a vet surgeon. Neither have those happened. So I gravitated into mining and I've no, never regretted it. It's been a wonderful career. With enormous reward. Be sure to join us on our next episode. And now, back to the show. And who else were you bouncing ideas around with, Adrian? Because in that time at Silicon Valley, everyone, I, my understanding was everyone sort of catches up pretty regularly and shares things, or is it every man for themselves? It's not. It's not every man for for themselves. It's it's a little bit like Israel. Um, you know, at the time Israel put their hand up and said, "We're really good at cyber security." Um, we we're actually providing the cyber security internals for some of those companies, including companies like Checkpoint and. The Rad Rad Group, 
um, was a big, big group out of Israel. You know, it's Team Israel in Israel, um, and in the U.S., it's what what you realize there is what does it take to build a global business, right? The idea, no matter how good it is, is five percent, and then you've got to okay, right? You've got to there's four things that have got to come together. And I'd say this is true for whether you're starting a business from scratch or whether you have taken a company private, private equity model, and, and you're looking to take cost out of the business, but most importantly, grow the top line, or, or you're an existing business and you're looking at adjacent markets. So you've got to, first of all, in my experience and in, in the US experience, the market's got to be big enough. Is it worth me going after it? Is it worth devoting the time and resources individually and as a company? Next, you got to think about the team. Like, do we have the expertise to go after this? Yeah. Or can we can we acquire the expertise? Or can we hire the expertise? Third is the technology. Can we build it? Can we license it? Some combination of that. And then the last one is the capital structure. So are we properly capitalized to go after this? Because you can be undercapitalized and not be able to grow as the market grows, or you can be overcapitalized, which means the cap table gets upside down and there's all sorts of misalignment in incentives for the operators to drive value in that business if, if, um, if there's um, all of these terms in favor, you know, overtly in favor of investors. So you've got to get those things right. Um, all of those things have to come together. So you finally left the States, you came back, and you headed up Data61. I did. What was the mission there? So look, Greg, when I was, when I was overseas, um, I wanted to give back to Australia and stay connected to Australia. And in the Valley, there would be a lot of, there'd be busloads of executives and directors that would come through Silicon Valley on the tech tourism circuit. And it was almost like... You know, I want to go and see an entrepreneur in their natural habitat, right? And I <laughs> get a photo. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. And there was this sense of something special is going on in Silicon Valley and we want to understand it. Like how is this part of the world that's it's no bigger than the greater area of Sydney. And yet the market cap of the SV one fifty, the one you know, just the biggest hundred and fifty companies in that is way bigger than the ASX, right? And mm. so how can that be? Um, so, so they came through and, and people were saying to me, the environment in Australia is just not conducive to building growth companies. So a lot of people were leaving and that, that troubled me. And that was, that was around the time that I was asked to be chair of Advance, Australia's expat network. Yep. It was a volunteer role. And we grew it from 1500 Australians to 24,000 across 83 countries during that time. Wow. And it was... It was mentorship. It was basically how do we give Australians a leg up when they're landing in another part of the world? Very, very senior people. It was phenomenal. We did like a TEDx model, you know, event, events all around the world. I think we did 160 odd events all around the world, yeah, well. completely self-organized by, by Australians on the ground. Anyway, put all that together and I was pretty concerned about Australia falling behind. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then I was asked, look, you're pretty vocal and have a point of view around what Australia needs to do to, to get on track. Why don't you come back? We've got this group, uh, two groups. We're going to merge them, each about 550 people big, um, to create this new entity. It needs a name. It needs a purpose. It needs direction. Um, and, uh, and that became Data61. So okay. Data 61, we gave it the name. 61 is Australia's country code. Yep. Um, we, we, uh, we merged the two organizations and, uh, and actually with a product management mindset, we completely evolved the model from a re – so I'm not a PhD. So I was brought into this role because of my operating experience and my commercialization experience. So looked at it with first principles and said, the problem here is that the research is not finding its way out of the lab. You go, well, why is that? Are okay. we doing the right research or focused on the right domains? So that was part of the challenge. But the second part of the challenge is it's hard to translate research into a prototype 
into a product, into something that can be taken to market. Yep. And that gap is product management that we were talking about before, but it's also engineering. So part of the organization had a small engineering outfit that was doing rapid prototyping. So I doubled down with the team on engineering and product management. And then the second thing, or the third thing that we did was said, all right, if we want to go and solve the hardest you know, most challenging problems, we need the best talent. So we've got to create the environment where the best can do the best work of their career. And we're not, we're, we're not going to be able to hire all of the people that are needed. So instead of thinking of ourselves as an institution, why don't we think of ourselves as a network? And we'll assemble the team from ourselves, from universities, so relationship with 31 universities, mm -hmm. a third of Australia's ICT PhDs under scholarship in Data61. Um, and we worked in the end, um, we completed 600 projects in four and a half years. We worked with 150 corporates and we had a portfolio, some of which was inherited, some of which was created of 14 ventures with a combined market cap of about two and a half billion dollars and, and, and growing. Pretty impressive, Adrian. It was an amazing group of people. And I'll tell you though, th those PhDs were so passionate about their work. Um, that's the thing that really fired me up. Did we convert a lot of that research into an outcome? Commercialize it? A lot of it, a lot of it we did. Yep. Um, and, and there's a lot sitting in the lab, yep. right? So, um, and I'd, we say, I'd say yes and no, okay, yes right. and no. Right. So there's different kinds of research, right? There's, there's simplistically fundamental and applied. So fundamental research is highly speculative, could take 10 years. Um, you know, and, and literally researchers would say to me, Adrian, slide the check under the door, leave me alone, come back in three or four years and, and good things will have happened. Okay. Right. Um, and then there's another group that, uh, are like, I want to have impact. I want to do something that's going to make a difference like more immediately. Yep. And, and then you have engineers that, uh, you know, they, they want to build product and they want to influence products. So, at that time, it wasn't only about translating research. We set a really strong North Star. And I'll give you an anecdote like early on. Uh, so I traveled around and I met the team and clearly they're all rock stars, right? In their own right. But I got asked to let a bunch of them go um, okay. and week two. And I said, no, I'm not gonna do that because the ones I let go now, the, the next ones are the ones that we really can't afford to lose. So I held an all hands, uh, got everyone together, and I said, I've just been told to fire, you know, effectively fire a hundred of you. And I said no. And I'm gonna back you. And you gotta back me. And we've got a you know, fifty-six million dollar operating hole that we've got to dig out of. You're right. And we got to pull together to do it to do it. And here's 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 the reason, or here's the thing that could get in our way. I said, I've traveled around, you, you you're all rock stars. No one's playing as a band. So right now there's a pyramid and you've put yourself as the researcher at the top of that pyramid. And then you've got a support team and then you've got an organization, which is like the umbilical cord for cash. Um, and we've got to turn that pyramid upside down. And actually at the top of the pyramid, we've got to put the country. We're here for the country. And we've got to create a purpose that says, actually what we're here for is to help Australia digitally transform great new tech based industry as well. And, and then it's about the organization data 61, and then it's about the team and then it's about the individual. And if we invert that, we'll build reputation, trust brand, and, and we'll have more support to do larger projects. And in the end, you'll get to do the research you want to do. And in fact, it'll be better, better resourced. Um, so that was a real cultural shift, right? And some people didn't come on that journey. Um, and, uh, you know, some people were honest about it too. And it's actually, I don't subscribe to that. You know, I want to go and sit in a university and just do my own research. Mm -hmm. And that's fair enough. Yeah. Um, and in a lot of cases, we maintained a relationship with them, but a different kind of relationship. Um, so, and, and then we looked at it and said, well, 
we've got to influence some of these policy settings. And that led to getting involved in things like Prime Minister and Cabinet Data Integration Partnership Committee and Board. Yep. You know, I sat on that. And, you know, and then when Greg Hunt was Minister for Health, there was this big push to re-engineer our healthcare system to a more precision, personalized health um, system and based on genomics and was asked to lead the ICT stream for that genomics mission. It was announced as a $500 million genomics mission, but it didn't pass through all the gates. So, so it didn't get stood up and I, I hope it gets revisited because there's a huge amount of potential um, in that. We built the first version of data.gov.au. We built um, National Map, which is, um, there's, I think there's about 15,000 spatial data sets yeah, right. o- overlaying on a map of Australia. So, and, and the consumer data rights open banking. So we directly translated research. We prototyped and showed corporates what was possible. And in that capacity, I was asked to speak with boards a lot. So mm-hmm. I would speak as, as a kind of what's coming next. How do we think about it in, in the context of the business? Because one, one of the things that I've had to do a lot in my career as an entrepreneur, when you see things that aren't immediately obvious, is you've got to be a bridge and a translator to bring it back into business terms. It's like that example of Philips. Yep. Like I could see that services were going to be delivered over a network to these devices, but the chair of the board and the board cared about taking cost out of the business right here, right now. You mean we don't have to get devices shipped back to fix them. We can do remote diagnostics. We can we can upgrade them. So, um, so so we tried to you know influence the the broader system around us as well, and we did. So AICD asked us to create the first cybersecurity curriculum for directors, and sure. we created that. Um, you know, and in the end, OECD called out what we built as global best practice for digital innovation. And T. Greg, it was bloody hard. Um, I wouldn't trade those four and a half years for anything, but um, it was it was brutally hard to kind of pull all of that off. And But we created an enduring asset for the country now. And even the National AI Centre, yep. we put that proposal up in 2006 to the okay. Morrison government. Yeah, okay. And 2006. In 2006, substantially yeah. the same proposal because it was the same business development person that led it in 2006. And and to to their credit, the current government and, and Minister Husick supported the proposal to push for the funding and, and the treasurer um, um, push, pushed for that. It was about you know, $120 million investment in a national AI centre. Are we charting on AI at the moment as a country? Are you behind on that one? We are behind, and and we're behind because uh, I think in part because we lost you know those five years. Um, I mean, look the talent, the talent at D sixty one and and the relationships. So we had relationships with um, Sandy Pentland at MIT, um, other universities around the world. Um, we secured the Olympics for AI. Europe's event conference. About 14,000 of the world's best were coming down here in Sydney, but for COVID, it got cancelled because of COVID. And that was a testimony to, that wasn't me. I signed the letter and, you know, encouraged the team to go for it. But that's the caliber of people that we had inside the organization and connected to the organization to be able to and, and it was into it was it was like it literally was like the Olympics. There were other countries competing to host it, and uh, and we got it. And unfortunately, because of the lags and the lack of commitment from multiple governments, a lot of that talent's left the country. It's sad. Well, the first time, Adrian. Unfortunately, is it? No. Now I was going to ask you what's the next big thing, but I think you've already started that. In your um your new business, which is Exoflare, you want to sort of share us about the concept, and what you're trying to take on there. Of course. So, when when I was involved in that national genomics mission, mm. and I got really close to understanding genomics, and think of it simplistically as, in the same way we program IT systems, we're going to be programming life, and we are. Like 
and that and that's um, manifest in new materials. Yep. So you think about things like synthetic biology, where you're effectively through a fermentation process taking kind kind of the core ingredients of um, spider silk and reproducing it to be able to spin new lightweight high tensile materials stronger than stronger and lighter than Kevlar yeah, right. as an example um, or genetically modified food products or personalized health products and I ask the question where's the guardrails where's the cyber cyber security equivalent here for these biological systems because there will be unintended consequences and people may have the best intentions um, I think there'll also be risks, right? Nefarious um, or bad actors um, that have to be considered. And so that's biosecurity. Mm -hmm. So that was the insight. And then the thinking was, well, is there an opportunity to build a platform that can, in the same way cybersecurity platforms can protect IT systems, that can protect our global food system from biological threats. So, so you're thinking global in this company, are you? Absolutely global. It's a new class. We think it's a new class of infrastructure. And if you look at the big cyber platforms, so mm. you know, Palo Alto Networks, market cap, $110 billion, CrowdStrike, $75 billion, um, you know, Zscaler, Fortinet, that there's a bunch of others. Um, we think that biosecurity as a category will be as important as cybersecurity. Now, it may not be as big because the threat vectors for cyber hit everything and every industry and everyone. Yeah. Um, and, and, in, and what we're talking about here with biosecurity and protecting food systems from biological threats, um, the global food system is a $10 trillion a year. Well, it's actually more than that, depending on there's some numbers ranging from kind of 10 to 14 billion and 16 to 20 percent of uh sorry trillion, trillion. and 16 to 20 percent of gdp yeah, right, okay. is uh so it's a so it's a huge thing right yep. and part of it as well is in the cyber world um and even in the data 61 realm part of part of what i was forced to do was to think about emerging threat vectors um for for national security and if you Think about contested domains right now. The primary contested domain is IT with cybersecurity and information, misinformation campaigns, information warfare. The next contested domain is arguably space. And we're seeing evidence of that. In fact, you know, there's some recent news because of the uh, um, you know, the satellite that's just broken up yeah. um, in recent days. Um but I firmly believe that the next contested domain beyond that will be food. So the, the threat vectors are changing exponentially towards our food system. Now, already we've got changing climate. We've got more trade, which can equate to more pathways for um, biosecurity threat. And that can be disease. It can be um, invasive species and pests. Yep. Um, We've got flus and stuff like that out there. It, ab absolutely, like Don't, bird bird yeah, flu yep. or avian flu. Yep. Um, and the economic impact can be devastating. So if we were, for example, to get foot and mouth, it'd be seventy billion dollars and potentially four or five years um, before we return to full export capacity for mm -hmm. our cattle. Okay. Um, or African swine fever, which is effectively a you know a bowler for pigs with a it's like a 90, high 90s uh, mortality rate, percent mortality rate. You know, that's estimated at two to $4 billion impact on our, on our pork sector. And then you think about protein. Yep. Well, any one of those proteins get taken out, then there's an inflationary impact and a supply impact on, on other remaining sources of protein. And so right now, you know, it's timely. Um, this avian flu outbreak, um, our software, and, and we've just launched the company, 
We've well, been we've been well, in let's, stealth. Let's, let's use this as a case study based on what the theory we started earlier. Yep. All right. So you're setting up this business and you're going to try to scale it. So you're going to have to talk us through that. Yep. You're going to bring in high quality people. Yep. And you've got a, a proposition to the market that no one else has. Yep. First have or all the above, I assume. Yeah. So, okay. So we have the insight. So you've done your research. Yeah. We, we spoke with 160 producers before we wrote code. We did a lot of research. Okay. And um, at CSIRO, there's a center in Geelong, which is a high containment um, zoonosis facility. So basically 60% of emerging human disease originates with animals. So that crossover. So right. And there's been a lot of focus, particularly post-COVID, on the human side. Yep. But what we're saying is this, this animal and agri side there needs to be more investment and, and a major uplift. Otherwise, it kind of we, we need to go to the source. Um, and so that facility in Geelong is world renowned. It's like Wuhan. It's a Wuhan equivalent. Um, so I spent time with the guy, the, the leader at the time was Trevor Drew, very respected globally in in this area, and said, "Convince me that this is not worth doing. Tell me, tell me that this is solved." And wherever I went, I heard it's not solved. There's a problem. Mm -hmm. And I think it's an existential threat um, you know, to, to our food systems and ultimately to our health. And in the same way that with cyber, it started with script kitties that were a nuisance. And now we're, we're down the road and we've got a branch of military focused on cyber warfare and nation states yep. involved. Yep. I don't think it's a stretch at all that we're going to see organized crime um, and nation state involvement in perturbing food systems or the inputs to food system, fertilizer, for example. Um, think about the importance of grains. Yeah. Um, for, well, if you give for, a country famine, you, give, you, you have a, um, a coup on your hands, surely an uprising, wouldn't you? If you want to turn a country off, turn off its food system, yeah, turn right. off its communications and its power, but yeah. turn off its food system. So, yeah, okay. so that's, that's the motive. And then we said, yeah. um, okay, there's a category to be created here. And we've a lot of research, gave it a label, bios, uh, biosecurity threat management. So if it sounds like cybersecurity, it's by design, okay. um, threat management. So then we said, how would you build a generalized platform to go after this? So mm -hmm. we did a lot of research around that and we built a prototype and we took a prototype to one narrow part of the market and proved it out. And now at the time of launch of the company, you know, we're running on uh, nearly 700 sites across six commodities and um, our economic unit that we think about is a risk assessment and we've crossed over hundred, several hundred thousand risk assessments on the platform. So we've proven a lot of it out. We've than our first deal in the Indo, and we're we're in good discussions in other markets in the world. Okay, so so going back to those four things I I said spoke about, you know, market, team, technology, and capital. Yep. Let's just run through them real quick. Yep. So the market, it's not a market right now. Like you're creating you're creating the market. Eh? We're creating the market okay. because government fundamentally solves a big portion of. Um, Biosecurity. In fact, our whole national system evolved about 10 years ago from quarantine, yep. which was keep everything out at the border, yep. to it's a shared responsibility. Biosecurity is a shared responsibility. And we're still through that transition because there's ambiguity around what that really means, what's industry meant to do, what's government meant to do. Really good people involved too. I'm not, in what I'm saying, I'm not at all like criticizing government or industry here. But the tools, we spoke about the tools before and the technology has evolved to such a degree that we can reimagine how we deal with biosecurity. And it's the use of data machine learning, um, new classes of sensors that we can put on trucks, on farms, um, right through to even genomics and the ability to do rapid in-field testing, looking for new, new pathogens, um, or even using cameras like computer vision it's got so good that you can do facial recognition of an animal. So right. even thinking about identification of animals or 
you look at the gait of the animal. Is it is it walking the way it should, or is it is it wobbly, or feeding patterns? You know, have has has there been a change in behaviour in a, in a herd or or a group of animals? So there's lots of things that are now possible. Okay, so then you go to the market. Is the market big enough? Is it worth going after? And you got to take a leap of faith here. And had I not lived through the cybersecurity market, it wouldn't have been as easy to go, yeah, let's go after it. This is going to be big. Like intuitively, you go, yeah, this is protecting food systems. But I remember in cyber, we would, we would when we'd go and sell our products early on, and we had the best products in the market at the time, there was a reluctance to pay. Like people go, oh, well, what is this cyber thing? Don't think it's going to be real. Don't think it's going to be a market. Who should pay? We don't want to pay. And then I remember one concrete incident where someone bought us a box and they said, can you guys break it? So I turn it around, turn around and give it to the engineers yeah. and say, can you break into this? And they come back half an hour later, big smiles, we're broken into it. We go back to, to the person that gave us the box and they're like, well, shit, that yeah. box is deployed throughout our smart grid infrastructure. Yeah, right. So now we have a, so we go to the manufacturer who's um, an international manufacturer of that kind of box. Well, they turned their legal turrets at us and said, you shouldn't have reverse engineered the box. You shouldn't have broke into it. And we didn't have a problem until you told us we had a problem. And now we do have a problem. So there's a bit of that around biosecurity, like Maybe I want to know I've got a problem. Maybe I don't want to know I've got a problem. It's got to be a massive uplift. There just has to be a massive uplift in, in the way that we deal um, and leverage technology to deal with biosecurity. So check. We convinced ourselves there's a market team. We levered some of the team out of Data61. Okay. Um, and then we've added quality people. So co-founder, Chris Aiken, um, you know, Chris, Chris ran KPMG's strategy practice in North America. Before that, he was, I think, the youngest partner at Anderson at 26, 27, and he started their global e-commerce practice uh, and scaled it. Um, CTO Richard Webby was CTO of uh, Disneyland and ran technology for Disney theme parks, yeah, okay. as well as CTO for Center Group. And you go, well, that where's Disney fit in? But this is the first first order principles thinking, right? You go, what do you need to solve for? If you're going to solve for biosecurity on a farm and in, in a value chain, it's cyber physical. So what I mean by that is you've got to sense the physical environment yep. and digitize and, and look for anomalies in the data that you're collecting. And Richard led the use of cameras for crowd control across 47 million visitors a year. Um, and the magic band, which is the RFID wristband that pays for things and open, opens doors. Well, a lot of cattle have RFID tags as well. So we said, that's a match, right? Like, this is the guy that we want. And I, I knew Richard, we'd, both Chris and myself, I met Chris on the advance board. Okay. And Richard sat on the advance board too. So we, we knew each other. And then we've added Andrea Koch, who most recently was on the board of the National Farmers Federation and led the development of their farm data code, which is, you know, ag again, you think about data as a real asset, and this is coming back to Australian companies as well. Mm -hmm. There's value in that. And the idea that you've got these, you know, big global platforms that um, assume that it's their data versus the farmer's data or the transporter's data or the processor's data. So the farm data code is applying principles around data ownership. And then we got a great group of investors, um, combination of national security and agriculture, and a great group of advisors wrap, wrapped around the business too. So, you know, some some high net worth investors, um, very prominent um, in tech in Australia, um, very prominent in ag in Australia. And so, so the team, check. Technology, check, right? Like we haven't nearly built everything that we want to build, this will be a five to 10 year journey, assuming it goes well. And, um, but I have confidence that we can build anything or hire the team um, to be able to build anything. And then, and then the capital structure, you know, this has been real learning for me. Like the fundraising process in Australia, very different 
than the US. Okay. Just in terms of um, how long, you know, fundraising can take, and um, you know, there there tends to be in Australia. Uh, pri- th- this is not just us. This is you know, talking with other entrepreneurs. A private equity mindset. So in private equity, which we're very good at as a country, you want to own as much of the company as you can for as little money as possible. Yep. In the venture capital model, when you're creating a new company you know, from, from scratch, you actually don't want that mindset. What you want to do is you want the early investors, they set a precedent. Everyone who comes after them goes, well, they got that term. I want that term. So I'll give you a simple example. There's um, a liquidation preference, right? So an investor, let's say an investor invests a dollar with a 1.5x liquidation preference. That means they get a do- you know they're guaranteed a dollar fifty out, the first dollar fifty out. So at the beginning of a company's life, it's probably okay. But then as you get further along, and the next investors come in, and the checks get bigger. Now let's say it's not a a dollar, but it's it's a $100 million check yep. and they want the 1.5 liquidation preference. Well, it changes the incentive alignment between the operating team yep. uh, and, and the investors. And ironically, it's actually better for the investors to not have as much ownership in the company early on because you're creating a bigger pie for everyone to share in. And the quality investors will look at a, at a later stage and go, hang on a minute. Um, the core operating team doesn't have enough skin in the game here. So, you know, the, the there's a guy called um, Joe Schoendorf, who's call him like chairman emeritus of um, Excel Partners. So Excel's probably got the best or one of the best IRRs in Silicon Valley, like 28, 29% over more than 20 years. Yeah. And Joe's the guy that backs Zuckerberg. And he's down in Australia a bunch because he sees talent, but he sees an inability to, you know, scale uh, in some cases. And um, and so, yeah, they did Atlassian and he, he's down here. So on on a trip in the past, um, I said to Joe, you got to meet me. Like, let's go have a drink. So we went and got a drink and I said, Joe, what is it? Like, why do you guys have the best IRR? Like what, what factors? And he goes, well, we looked at everything. We looked at market. We looked at a whole bunch of variables. And you know what it came down to? It came down to the founder is still involved with the business. Yeah, that so that vision, that energy. And they may not be the CEO or in the exec team, but they're so connected to the business that they're ringing the bell at the IPO. Yeah, okay. And, and any time that's happened, we've got outsized returns. And so, um, yeah, so the, the, the capital structure is really important. And I see a lot of entrepreneurs with great ideas, great markets, great tech, and they've done something that they shouldn't have done um, in their early capital raises that mean no one's going to touch them later on. So they're almost done before they started and it kills me. And I I would be on the other end of that in Silicon Valley and people would come over and go, I've got this great thing. Here's where we're at and go, okay, well, tell me, tell me about your cap structure. And, and already, you know, investors would be owning 40 or 50% of the company. No one's going to back that. It's just a different model. And, and I think the good VCs here get that. Um, We're, we're fortunate. We've got a great, lead investor and other investors that understand that. Um, you know, the Blackbirds and Air Trees of the world and Square Pegs, they, they understand that too. Um, and it's kind of like, I don't know if you remember in the US, um, the group Y Combinator that stood up as like an incubator and a feeder. So, you know, Airbnb, Stripe, a whole bunch of them came through Y Combinator. Yep. And Ron Conway, who's often referred to as a godfather of Silicon Valley, invested in my company, uh, the cyber company, and he invests in a lot, right? It's like Ron's almost got like an index fund of Silicon Valley startups. Um, But what Ron pushed with Y Combinator was a standardization of angel investment terms and seed stage investment terms. 
and and did it so that the guys that come after the write the much bigger checks, there's no friction. They look at it and go, okay, standard terms, we're in. So if we go back to the beginning, we talked about Australia being well, those to be bold and take the world on. Okay, you're halfway through your story. So you've got the technology, you've got the people, you've got the plan, you've done the research. Yep. You're still based in Australia, aren't you? You're still based in Sydney. Are you really going to take the world on? This has to be a global infrastructure. There's no question about it. So look, in the same way Israel put up their hand and said, we're really good at cyber security. And it was at the time the US understood more deeply the importance of cyber security. Israel not only generated new industry, they not only made other parts of their economy stronger, yep. they had outsized geopolitical influence because of that cyber security capability. And you could argue that they still do, mm. right? There is no reason that Australia can't be the leader in the world in biosecurity. And where we've got a strong agriculture economy. Yep. We're good at biosecurity. Um, part of that is, you know, we're, we're effectively a big island and we've, um, we've put a lot of emphasis on biosecurity. We were the last country in the world to get hit with varroa mite that, that hit us recently. So obviously affecting bees and pollination. Um, we're the last country with avian flu or bird flu, or one of the last countries to to have been hit by it. So we're we're very good at it, and this this will not only protect our agriculture exports and economy. It's a new industry in its own right, and these biology based industries, and particularly this industry, will spawn other in innovation around pathology, sensing and diagnostics. You know, spatial intelligence as well. Um, huge layer of low Earth orbit based spatial data and intelligence that will play play into this as well. And it can be global infrastructure led from Australia. So we're global from day one. Our mindset is global from day one. I even though we've just closed to financing, I was on the phone two days ago with 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 a firm that I'd like nothing more for them to lead our Series A financing in 18 to 24 months. I was in the US, you know, a month ago yep. and meeting with, you know, leadership in some of some of the agencies that uh, are very focused on biosecurity or have the remit in the US for biosecurity. Um, we've already done a deal in the Indo. Um, I've been on the phone with parts of UK government as well. Um, there's no question. This this has to be global. And look, I'm I'm under no illusion. It's really hard to do things that haven't been done before. And I've done that a lot through my career. And there's no roadmap. There's no roadmap, but that's the opportunities for us to create and define it. But but it's not like where, you know, even even Google had a different technique for search. But they they were what number thirty or low forty search engine into the market. Um, so in the same way there was with cyber, everyone goes, oh, actually, this is a market. And then in Silicon Valley, what happened, there were startups popping up like mushrooms all over the place, all claiming to solve cy you know, cyber security. So I think we'll go through a cycle of that with biosecurity where you know, I think on the heels of what we're doing and more attention and I think the market's coming towards us. and then there'll have to be a, a shakeout or a shake, you know, around who's actually solving the right problems or not. So yeah. for me as CEO, the focus that I continually giving the company is, are we solving the right problem? Are we solving the pointy end of this? And not, not biosecurity theater, that's what we'd call, called it in the cyber days, where okay. you give this false sense of security to right. people but you actually go the hard path and solve the problem and and uh, and and invest for the long term, like the hiring decisions, the culture, the relationships. The reason we haven't launched, despite the fact we've had product in market for a couple of years, is we've wired up a bunch of the key relationships. We're, we're on a cycle of learning and development that I think is going to be hard for others to catch. We're not invincible. The odds are against us, 
that we're going to succeed. I mean, they just are for, for any company that's starting. But this problem has to be solved. And we may go all the way to solve it. I hope we do. We may go part way to solve it and conclude that we're better off as part of a, another organization that has global reach that can get, get there faster. Or we may fail and someone stands on our shoulders and you know goes again or we go again. But um, everything's lining up the right way. And for me, this feels stronger. The market pull feels stronger than it did in cybersecurity in the early days. Governments all across the world engaged in this, one would think, wouldn't they? Bearing in mind what you talked about, the fear of food security. Yeah, yeah. And um, But there's a massive uplift that's got to happen around the world. I'll give you a concrete example. Yeah. Is you've got to be able to share threat intelligence data. So in the same way you do with cybersecurity, threat intelligence data. But there's no global standards or protocols for how to share bios or even describe biosecurity risks in a standardized way. Okay. So there's a lot, a lot to do yet, um, which is opportunity as well. But government here, I think, needs to really get behind this as a new industry. Yep. Like, look at SpaceX again, just going back to SpaceX. Yep. Right. So the shuttle program ends and the cost per kilo to put something into low earth orbit is is roughly $53,000 a kilo. Um, the Falcon 9 is roughly $2,700. The Starship, when it's, um, you know, succeeds, um, they reckon about $150 to $200 per kilo. And when it reaches reusable status, about $10 a kilo. Yeah, right. Okay. Right. So the role of NASA hasn't diminished at all in any of this, right? So the lunar mission, NASA's got a, a, a role that's as important as ever, but now they've got thousands of space industry companies that they can draw from to deliver a better outcome. So it's the same with biosecurity. Like if, if Australian government and state governments get behind this as a new industry creation opportunity and arguably we're even better placed in this than we are with quantum because of where we come from and who we are. Yep. We're, we're even better placed than AI. We're certainly better placed than manufacturing solar panels when you know China's flooded the market three times over and Germany's using solar panels for fences. Yep. It's like this is an incredible opportunity for the country. And at the end of the day, the government's going to have – a lot of benefit as well because they got their role's not going to ch diminish in any way, right? Like there's things that like take border force. There's a social license. There's an expectation that government's going to be there to solve that problem. Um, then they, they shouldn't outsource that. But to be able to access innovative technology um, and and apply that to achieve their mandate, everyone's better off. Looking through the lens of an entrepreneur. How does this nation, when we, on, let's go back to the start, when you had some concerns and some worries, how does this nation become match fit then? We've got to, I think as a country, have a stronger North Star. Like where's the articulation of the vision for Australia, not leading into the next election cycle, but over the next decades? Who are we as people and, and what do we stand for is going to become more important than ever. At the end of the day, in Australia, but I think actually all around the world, but primarily in Australia, I think if, if we don't change the way we're leading nationally, you know, inside of companies, yep. individuals, yep. you know, the accountability and the drive to, to improve. Yep. I think there's going to be a reckoning. And the consequence of that is we won't have the high growth industries that produce the jobs. We'll be only a service-based economy of small to medium-sized businesses. We'll be a price taker. We'll have a much more fragile economy in, in a world where you know supply chain, supply chain, supply chain resilience is being challenged. 
And ultimately, there's a national security dimension to what I'm talking about because there's a lot of focus on, you know, defense is, is the answer. Defense equates to national security. But a strong and prosperous, you know, economy and companies that are global franchises like BHP, CSL, we have, we, you know, car sales. There, there are a lot of companies that are aspiring and are um, global franchises. We need we need more of them, and I think we can do it. But I just think we need to have intellectually. I said it before: intellectually honest conversations and hard conversations. We we'll put call, it on the table. Call, call the stuff out. Call it. And it's not it's not that you're passing judgment when you're calling it. Yep. But it's like let's be better. Let's you know let's um, let's grow. Let's grow as a, as a country and let's grow you know, as a company. On that, Adrian, it's been an absolute pleasure to have you here today. Thanks, Rick. Appreciate it. You've been listening to No Limitations. 